in New Zealand, it's customary to start uh, a talk if you're um, from the indigenous background, which I am, with a little uh, saying, a little proverb. So I'll start with that. Fano, fano, haramai te toki, homie, huie, taiki. That means uh, come together, give me my axe, let us build a canoe together. And that's kind of sums up what I think Koha is. is if we come together, we can uh, build something good. Um, is there a way that I can change slides or do I have to wave to... Okay. So I'll just go like that when I need a new slide. Does that work? Okay. Like that, please. <laughs> can we go to the next? Yes, there we go. So uh, this is who I am. I am uh, Chris Cormack. I am uh, from New Zealand. I have ancestry from Kaitahu, Kaiti Mamoi, and Waitaha. They are the Māori people from the bottom of the South Island of New Zealand. If you want to go back afterwards and Google Google for Invercargill, and you can see the area that I'm, my family's from. Um, I, I also don't have a PhD or a master's. I've, I've got two bachelors, though. Um, I've got a bachelor in, in uh, science and uh, majoring in computer science and a bachelor in arts majoring in mathematics and Māori studies. Um, yeah, I work at Catalyst IT now, which is the third, uh, third company I've worked at all working on Koha, which is a quite, a, I think, a unique kind of free software thing that you can work on the same software at different companies. So I'm going to just, for the keynote, I'm going to quickly run through 16 years of history in about 16 minutes, if I can. So <laughs> here we go. So that picture there is uh, Levin Library. That's where Koha was started. Uh, as, um, as has already been said, Koha was started in 99 as a response to a Y2K problem. Um, uh, the library had an issue that uh, come 2000, books were going to be issued to 1970, which is good if you have uh, fines because suddenly the library is very rich and everyone owes it a million dollars, but not so good if you actually want people to use the library. So, uh, I briefly told people at Informatics this yesterday, so you can uh, not listen if you want. <laughs> but um, New Zealand in the 99 didn't have good internet. Uh, it still doesn't have good internet in a lot of places in the rural places. We're, we're a big, well, compared to India, we're a small country, but we're uh, a sparse country. There's only 4.4 million people, and we've got a landmass bigger than the UK. So people are spread out, so uh, there's lots of places in New Zealand that still doesn't have good internet. So we needed a system that would be fast over slow phone lines and cost effective. Um, and we were doing technical evaluations on the RFP responses and we noticed that none of these solutions would actually work. So um, there was two people working at, at Katipo Communications at the time and we both blame each other, but one of us said, a library system's just a big database. How hard can it be? And that was the start of Koha. That was September, yeah, early September, we started work on Koha. And we had to get it finished by January 3rd. So if we move on to the next one, please. So yeah, there we go. What we wanted, we only had three months to write an ILS, which um, is kind of ridiculous. And I think if I hadn't been much younger than I am now at the time, I never would have decided to do it. Um, there's a lot to be said about being young and naive. You, you start projects that you couldn't, you, if you thought about, you'd never actually start. Um, so we, I worked for a little company there called Caliport Communications, and uh, we decided to build the basic library system so you could circulate books, you could acquire new books, you could uh, catalog books, you could look after your patrons. It wouldn't have a full acquisitions module or a serials module because those are big and hard and complex and would get it done and then clean it up. Um, so that's what we did. So we delivered on time. Um, January 3rd, which was the first open day after the New Year's break in New Zealand, we turned on Koha and turned the other system off and it hasn't been switched off yet, so that's good. Well, I lie. it fell, uh, we had maintenance done in the server room and someone knocked the server out of the rack onto the floor, so that's the only big outage we've ever had in Koha. <laughs> you can't really do software to fix that. So 
what we decided at that point was that we were a small company. There were um, 14 of us at Kazipo Communications. We didn't want to be supporting uh, Koha forever. We didn't want to leave the libraries in the same situation they were just in, that they had a so software they liked, but they couldn't change it because it was proprietary. Um, so we, we talked them into, well, they weren't that hard. Libraries generally understand sharing, so they're easier to talk into free software than other organizations. Um, we, we convinced them to do that, and we cleaned up the code and released it about June of, two th yeah, June 6, 2000. So that's kind of what it looked like. It's not pretty. Um, it's not pretty. It's a lot prettier now. Um, but it, it worked, and uh, it really it was. It was within three hours we had about ten people around the world downloading it. One of the first users um, outside of New Zealand was a guy called Glenn Stewart, who was in Detroit, and he worked for. He he never told me, but he he worked for one of the car manufacturers, either General Motors or Ford, or one of the ones that were in Detroit in that time, uh, and he catalogued all used Koha to catalog all of their manuals for the engineers because they would previously just had that in an Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Uh, he was the first person to send a patch from outside of New Zealand as well. What else do I... uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, there we go, Glenn Stewart. And then uh, down the bottom you can just see Steve Tonneson. He was from uh, the Coastal Mountain School District in uh, British Columbia in Canada. He installed Koha in 14 schools there. Uh, and automated previously unautomated libraries there. Um, and he, re he wrote a, the original Koha we didn't use, uh, we used web for everything except the circulation client. We used an old, it was a TT, uh, VT1000, like an old, you had the Telnet and, and it was like plain uh, type away or scanner barcode, really fast, but uh, meant that you had to have SSH access to the machine. So he rewrote that as a web-based circulation client, um, some of which still remains. It's been rewritten about six times since then, um, but it's still there. Uh, if we move on, please. So around 2001 through to 2005, the community outside of the main uh, non-English speaking uh, countries started growing. Koha was interesting because in New Zealand we have three official languages, well, two really. English is an official, but it's what everyone speaks, and then Māori and uh, sign language are the other two official languages. So Koha was written to be bilingual from the start, so it made it easier for other people, like the French developers and stuff, to translate it into French because we already had a translation framework. So um, Paul Skuza is from uh, Poland. He uh, was working in a university there. He installed Koha there, and he translated uh, the OPEC, the public interface, into Polish. And then around 2002, Paul Poulan had been made uh, redundant from his job and um, noticed this thing, Koha, and noticed that there were a lot of libraries running um, big proprietary, really expensive proprietary systems that didn't actually serve their needs, and he could see that there was an opportunity to, to help libraries and help himself because he you know, needed a new career, so he started then. Um, he now, often Paul and I give this talk together, um, and we, we really confuse people because I speak in Māori, he speaks in French, and no one knows what's going on, but <laughs> without him, we're just going to do it in English today. But. Um, he installed it in an, an abbey there. Uh, it was the first uh, French installation. Koha now is the second most used library system in the whole of France, uh, behind Circe Dynix. And I think we should pass them by the end of this year to be the most popular library system in France, which is a huge achievement. Um, and uh, something that Paul can be, and his company, Biblibra, can be really proud of. So in 2002, we released Koha 1.2. This was a big improvement over the original one. Um, we had, we, and we set up a, a wiki uh, to document, to allow other users to document Koha. We um, had two main problems. Like I said, we had a translation framework. It wasn't that effective, so we needed to fix that a bit to make it easier to translate. 
and we wanted to add, Koha when it was originally built didn't support Mark. Um, because the library we wrote it for weren't using Mark, so there was no point adding Mark support at that point. So around version 1.2, we wanted to add Mark support in uh, because um, a lot of the European and American libraries, all of their cataloging was done in Mark. So if we wanted to have more of them using it, we needed that. Um, the Mark is a really a, a good example of um, a standard um, and. One of the sayings that I've heard a lot, and it's true, is the nice things about standards is there's so many to choose from. And that's the same with Mark. You start working in Mark and you think there's one version, but there's Mark 21, there's Can Mark, there's Dan Mark, there's Uni Mark, there's UK Mark. So every kind of country ended up with their own one. It's kind of conglomerated on two now, Uni Mark and Mark 21. And uh, so we tried to add support for those two in, in 2002. Um, and by the end of that year, we had 17 people. So started off with three people. Uh, by two years, we had 17 people that had committed code to Koha. So it's quite a nice growth. Also, at this point, we were getting lots of people working on Koha kind of all around the world. Um, and we needed to kind of get up to get some kind of structure to, to the project to make sure that people knew when releases were going to happen, who to talk to those kind of things. So we elected a team. Kaitiaki is a, another Māori word, it means guardian. Um, so we had a guardian, that was, his name was Pat Isla, he, he now works for Amazon, I think. Um, and we had elected Paul, the release manager, for the next version. Um, I became the release maintainer, uh, which is a far easier job than a release manager. And, uh, Something that I hope we will get in the next few years, we'll have, well, even maybe the next release, we'll have our first Indian release maintainer. I think that would be fantastic. But um, then I took on a, um, well, then we had the role that's been really hard to fill was the next one, was uh, a QA manager. We had a, a woman called Ingrid. She lasted about three months, and then the company she worked for uh, changed their focus. Um, that's a really, really hard job and you need a special person to do that well. Um, and we had a guy, Nicholas Roscosco, who was in uh, Baltimore, who was doing our documentation. The nice thing about working with libraries is they like organisation. They like, they like um, cataloguing things. They like putting things in the right place. So it's quite easy to find people to write manuals and stuff for you, which is good. A uh, lot, lot of free software projects, that's a really hard thing to get done. So yeah, in, in the, the next couple of years, we continued on our mark support. We added authority support. We uh, added serial support. Originally, that was uh, just kind of corporate serials for a corporate library. And that's, over the years, has been expanded to do public library serials, academic library serials, etc. We added a much better uh, reporting tool. And we uh, changed the OPAC quite a bit uh, and added some features like um, book reviews and uh, comments and um, what else did we add around there? I think those were the main ones back then. Oh, and covers. And then we added a feature to allow bulk importing of mark records inside Koha itself. Previously, you'd have to get a technician to get on the command line and run a command to do that for you. We allowed that the librarians to do that themselves, um, which was a big, big advance. And we elected a new team around there. Um, Rachel Hamilton Williams was my uh, boss still at that stage, um, and she was awesome. And then we this yeah we jumped into version two because now we had Mark support. So um, Paul became the release maintainer, and Joshua took over release management. Um, again, we had a QA manager for about four months, and then he he, he left as well because it's a lot of work, and unless your organisation is supportive of you doing it, you have to spend a lot of your own time and it's not really sustainable for a lot of people if they want to actually spend time with their wives or their husbands or have a life or sleep, those kind of things. Um, and we took on a new documentation manager who was Stephen Hedges, who was the head of um, Athens Public Library in Ohio in the US and he took over that role, did a really good job as well. Um, Right, so yeah, in 2006, 
we realized that the way we'd implemented Mark didn't scale. So we'd get to a library of around six or seven hundred million, uh, six or seven hundred thousand records, and that was kind of our ceiling. We, the way we'd in, uh, added the Mark support, we'd done it purely in SQL, and it was it was efficient until you got to a large size, and then it got really slow to search. So we decided we had to re rewrite that. Um, and we decided to move to Zebra, which if you're using Koha, you all will have probably um, disliked it breaking on you at some point. It's a really good piece of software, but it's very uh, rigid in what it expects. If you give it any, any records that it doesn't expect, it, it, it just dies. So it's not, um, it's really good at what it does, but it's, we've kind of reached the limitations of that as well. Uh, we had our first Koha conference. Um, so the first Koha conference is, was actually KohaCon 06. So if you look at the Koha cons, they always have a number afterwards. That's actually the year, not the not the number of the conference. So we've only had this year we will have had seven. Um, that was in France, and we had yeah a really good first conference, 120 attendees in Paris, and then we had a, a five-day um, developer conference in Marseille where we worked on changing this. It's amazing how much you can get done. Um, uh, Sunil was talking about the, the people getting together and working on code. If you put five or 10, 15 people in a room together for five days, they can get an amazing amount of work done in that time. Um, especially if they don't have to worry about cleaning the toilet, someone else is looking after it for them. So the next one, please. In, in 2006, 2007, we switched from uh, CVS to, um, well, we switched from SourceForge to Savannah because SourceForge looked like they were moving in the wrong direction at that point. Um, and Savannah was run by the Free Software Foundation, so it's a bit more stable. And then later on, we switched to Git, which is our version control system. Um, if you've ever tried to do work in Koha, you will have played with Git. Uh, not in Koha, but development around Koha, you'll have played with Git. It's the most common used uh, version control software now. And uh, this, was, this round then was the first kind of non, well, first localized kind of website. So Koha FR was launched in France. Um, so it's a friend, it's all of it. Pretty much a copy of Koha, the Koha site, but in French for the French developers. Okay. Um, this is this is this was a, a, a one of the least uh, fun periods of my life. Uh, in 2007, I left to work a, at a company called Libline. Um, I left Kalipo Communications, and I thought, and what I thought would be a good move. Um, because they're a, a bigger US company and they'd be able to help Koha along a bit more. Um, something happened, they got offered a lot of money and things changed in the way that they wanted to do business and they decided to, to move more towards uh, Koha. I won't go into the details of licenses because I'll be here all day, but Koha's license under GPL3, which is a really good license except for it doesn't really deal with software as a service type model. Uh, the, the predicate is that if you release, if you give someone the binaries, the executables, you have to give them the source code. But if you never give them the binaries, they just use them on your server, you never have to give them the source code. So this is what Liblime started doing. They weren't breaching the license, they were breaching the spirit of the license. Um, so yeah, we all, uh, there was three of us who were working for Liblime from New Zealand. We resigned on the same day, and about over the next year, most of the other developers resigned as well. Then Liblime was uh, bought by PTFS, and they're a big-ish um, US company. They mainly do defense contracting, um, but they had a product called Archivalware, and they wanted a library system to go with it, so they bought, um, they bought Liblime. And the people who owned Libline were quite smart at business in this regard. They sold them something that they didn't own. So PTFS thought they bought Koha. You can't actually buy Koha. So what they bought was a bunch of uh, support contracts 
and uh, with people that weren't happy with their vendor. So the people from Libline did a really, in, in their eyes, shrewd business deal, but it meant that there was a new company, PTFS, that didn't understand free software, thought they owned Koha, kind of interacted with the community in that way, started trying to tell everyone what they should do, and you can't say that because we own Koha, and et cetera, et cetera. So there was a rift there. If we move on to the next one. The, yeah, like I said, the reason was that the reason that Koha just continued on was because they couldn't actually own it. You know? they, in order to own Koha, we have distributed copyright. I own a bunch of copyright in there. Horofino Library owns copyright. Informatics owns some copyright. It, you would have to buy every single person's copyright off them or rewrite all the bits that you didn't own. So they couldn't actually buy the software. That, that, that's a protection of the license. Um, and even if they did buy the software, they only buy it, bought it going forward. You can't unrelease it. So people can just fork and keep going on with their version. So in terms of what this actually meant for the rest of the world, nothing really. Koha just continued on. For us as developers in the community, it meant I had to talk to lawyers a lot, I had to waste a lot of energy around that when I'd rather be developing software. Um, it did teach me a lot of lessons around, um, some of which I've had to unlearn again. It taught me some distrust, which then I had to unlearn again because I don't think that's a, a good proposal to, to go into meetings with, distrusting who you're meeting. But that, it, 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 I took a year off from Kohar at that point. I was quite disillusioned in it. Um, we move on. So in the end, what we did was they owned koha.org, which is why you shouldn't go there. You should always go to koha-community.org. Sooner or later, they'll forget to renew it and we'll get it back. But at the moment, they're holding on to it, mainly just because they want to be annoying, I guess. Um, so we set up a new site. All of the stuff goes through there. Um, we had another Koha Con in Texas, then one in Wellington, and then one in Tane in India, uh, and then one in Edinburgh in the UK, and then one in Nigeria last year, and uh, one in Argentina, and this year is in Greece. So um, start writing proposals to your funding agencies to get travel to Greece. It'll be a really good conference. It's going to be in, on the beach in Greece. It's well worth it. Um, but what happened is, the relationship never really normalised with PTFS Liblime. They've gone their own way and we've gone ours. And so it's, it's probably best that we just leave each other alone at the moment. Um, and by the end of 2009, already 90 libraries had left. So, And they don't even, if you look at their website now, they say they do bibliovation, which is what, they, what Koha was. And so it's Koha plus all their changes. So they've stopped calling it Koha as well, so I think it's finally finished. But there was two years of... Uh, lawyers are nice enough people, but they're expensive to talk with. You don't want to have to do it too much. Um, next page, please. So what we did in 2010, we decided to move to time-based releases. Um, so, and what we used to do is what we called uh, feature... well, you know, feature critical releases, or we would critical mass releases, I think a lot of people call them, we'd, we'd only release when we thought we had enough features in there, which meant that some releases would take three months, some would take two years, libraries didn't know, they didn't know when the upgrade's going to be, it's hard to budget for those kind of things, it's hard to, if you're a support company and you want your patch in a version, you don't know what, when that version's going to be released, it's hard for everyone. So we switched to, we've copied the uh, canonical, the Ubuntu model, and switch to six monthly releases. Um, we finally got a QA manager and she has stuck around for six years now. So her name's Katrin Fisher. Um, if you've done any Koha work, you will have, uh, on the developing side, you would definitely um, seen her name in emails. Um, she's the one who tells you in the most politest way that there's something wrong with your code. <laughs> but she is a trained librarian who moved into kind of software development as a necessity and, and uh, and she's also German, so it's kind of like double the organisation skills. You've got a German librarian, so she's super organised. Nothing gets past her. Um, and yeah, we, we 
kind of it was a new lease of life for the project that way we had kind of certainty like I said the rest of the community kind of just kept on trucking more libraries were installing it more support companies were joining but us as a community took a it, 2009 not a lot got done in terms of new big new features but 2010 it took off again yes, please. Um, we released yeah the first time base released we added another mark at this point nor mark so now Koha supports three mark um, like I said the standard that isn't um, we switched to uh, using a different templating tool to make it much easier to render pages uh, and we moved all of the item information out of the record level down to its own level um, so that was a massive change there um, and then uh, we added in this I'm pretty sure I'm at worked on a lot of this stuff uh, I think when you're at OSS labs maybe on uh, easier analytics records so that was kind of our first big contribution out of India around 2011 in October um, and yeah you can see like even in that six months we managed to do 365 bug fixes and enhancements and that's an amazing amount of work in, in six months um, time please. we moved on to again something that was uh, really useful for Delhi public we added hourly loans uh, and I think it even goes down to half hourly now um, we added an offline circulation module also really uh, useful for countries like uh, Nigeria and Vietnam and stuff who have unreliable power and unreliable internet you need to be able to still issue a book if you have to switch to your generators or whatever um, we redid the entire staff interface at that point and another 130 enhancements and by this point where there were 71 different people had contributed to Koha so you can see in, in 12 years we'd grown that much um, move on to the next one then we uh, switched to we we had a problem with Koha that it wasn't fast enough and this is uh, this is always a problem with all pieces of software ever um, you can always try and make them faster we worked on that we did a responsive OPAC uh, I don't know if anyone in India ever ran there was a theme called CCSR that came out of a library in Quebec in, in Canada it was a, a nice responsive you resize the screen and uh, interface changes to work um, again even more work um, there's 43 pages of a release notes for that one it was and again this is still only in six months so you can see the kind of the growth is just exponential We're, well not quite exponential quadratic at least it's just growing really fast um, if we moved on to the next one we took on two more releases in, in 2013 uh, big one again really useful one patron self-registration and we managed to link um, in the serials module subscriptions to acquisition details which is really helpful for your accounting um, and we also did uh, branch limited authorized value uh, if you've played with Koha you know there's a whole lot of authorized values you can set up for like circulation uh, collection codes or um, lost values they used to be tied for the whole library so if you had six branches in the library they all had to use the same shelf locations but this one let you define different shelf locations for different branches those kind of things um, and, and then we had um, course reserves which is uh, I, I'm assuming uh, Indian libraries use uh, Indian academic libraries use these as well but they're big in the states it's where you have uh, things that are reserved for a, a, a course so they're not allowed to go out of the library they just stay in the stack room or something and people borrow them for 10 minutes or 20 minutes to photocopy the pages they need um, and we moved to uh, a bootstrap theme if any of you have used Twitter the theme they use is bootstrap so we use that as well which was a nice move for us because it means that and there's so many other projects using this now it's a, a templating system we don't have to maintain ourselves um, when the newest version of HTML5 comes out they just update bootstrap we don't have to worry about dealing with that uh, and we also added another offline circulation module so in the meantime uh, 
back when I said it was kind of finished, it kind of wasn't. With Liblom, that, that PDFS had registered a trademark and well, tried to trademark the word koha in New Zealand, um, which was annoying because they'd never actually done business in New Zealand as Liblime. Um, so we again had to have lawyers and uh, the really nice thing about this is a lovely story. When they registered the trademark, uh, Horofuna Library Trust did a blog post about the fact that you know people are trying to trademark this from out of the country. Within about 32 hours, people around the world, including from India, had donated $11,000 to the defence fund to pay for a lawyer to do that. And what was even nicer, a law firm in New Zealand donated their time pro bono, one of the big IP law firms in New Zealand. Um, so that managed, that $11,000, some of it got refunded and some of it, people said, just use it for some core cool features. But that was a remarkable kind of uh, showing the, the love, I guess, that people have for the software. So eventually we, we won that. Um, we kind of always do, it just takes a lot of time. Um, it's nice, the thing I'd do from, the thing I would have learned from this is just to train market yourself first, which we should have done, but I was naive and I didn't think you could, it's a common word in New Zealand, I didn't think you could trade market, but it turns out in New Zealand you can trade mark pretty much anything you want as long as you tie it to a specific thing. So, koha in relation to library management systems. Um, so we, that's all sorted now. That's held by the trust, along with the EU uh, mark and the uh, Australian trademark. So we should be safe from that. So this is a brief graph that I did to try and show you kind of the trending upwards in growth. Um, it's a, if you can see, uh, so the blue blue line is the number of developers, and the scale on the left is, uh, so that's about it's showing about 250 developers at that point um, the commits are times 100 so we're at about two 20,000 commits at that point and the bug numbers are times 100 as well no, the bug numbers are times 100 as well so it's about uh, I think we must have about 15,000 um, most of them are closed, thankfully. Bug, bug and enhancement reports in, the, in Koha. Uh, I just, yesterday I looked at the numbers and there are actually 295 uh, different developers now that have, have code in Koha, which is, which is quite remarkable. If you look at open source and free software projects around the world, it's probably one of the larger uh, developer bases. Um, there are a few that, like uh, Linux and Drupal and a few other ones that are bigger, but it's it's a pretty big, um, pretty big number. So the, the, we're nearly to the end. Um, in 2014, we uh, redid the uh, plaque support to make it faster again, um, and we changed templating uh, for the notices. If you've used that before. We did also uh, end of fiscal year report, so you can roll over budgets. Um, automatic renewals, SAU download, and on-site checkouts. So there's a, a module you can use in Koha that can record local use. So um, a lot of libraries like to know that people have taken the book off the shelf, maybe read it, and then often people leave them on the table or walk out of the library. They still want to count those as a use, use of statistic. To, so you can check those in and they won't get counted as actually being on issue, but you'll be able to see um, that they were used locally in the library. Um, it's good. Libraries, I think, in the whole world are in this position where they have to justify their existence all the time and they're constantly um, seeking, people are constantly trying to cut their budgets and those kind of things. So the more statistics that we can give libraries to prove how much they're being used and how useful as a service they are, it's, it's the better for the project. So we've done a lot of work on that. When, yeah, this is the last uh, release was uh, 322. Um, we switched, uh, originally we used to do April and October, but we now do May and November. So it's one, one month off Ubuntu, so you don't have to upgrade your OS and your library system at the same time. Um, we did this one, a really useful one is batch editing of records, which people have been wanting for years, where you can uh, edit 
you know, 200, 2,000, 20,000 records all at once to change maybe the shelf location or to change the Dewey, say you want to switch from Dewey to LC numbers or something like that. Um, and discharge notice generation, another development out of India um, for when people leave, I think I'll get this right, someone can commit green later, when people leave a university they need to have a notice to to hand in to say that they don't have any books overdue at the library or it's something like that. Um, uh, I'll have to read the bug report again to get it quite sure, but it's, it's something that uh, lots of academic institutions wanted anyway. I think they use it in, in France as well. Um, and in the last release we have full plaque risk report, which means that Koha runs a lot faster than the earlier versions. Um, we did a lot more work on uh, accessibility stuff, which was really good that, that you touched on that. We had one, um, one of the developers early in Koha was a guy from France who is a Buddhist monk and he's blind and he did, so he did a lot of work around uh, accessibility and so we try and keep up to that. The really good thing with accessibility, if you make it good for disabled users, you make it good for everyone. Like the way you make a website logical for someone who's visually impaired makes it logical for someone who can see as well. Yeah. Things go, depending on where you're from in the world, right to left or left to right, top to down. You know, if you make it work that way so that they can navigate the page that way, people's eyes do the same thing. Um, and uh, audio alerts. And we added a RESTful API, which makes it easier for you to hook. Uh, we had about three other APIs. We've added another API, but this one's documented a bit nicer. That makes it easy to hook, say, your uh, open access repository or whatever else up talking to Koha. So if you add a new journal, you can automatically have it catalogued straight into Koha, those kind of things. Right, so this is where we are now. And this is kind of uh, what I'm hoping we can get, that this is the start of, is that I know there's lots and lots of users in, of Koha in India, and I know that there's lots of uh, really smart developers doing really smart things. I know there's lots of smart librarians who want lots of features. The, the, the current situation is most of these are not getting to the main Koha code base. So when a library needs to upgrade, if they've done a whole lot of customizations, they have to get the developer to do all of them again. I um, mean, there's a whole lot of ideas that would probably benefit other libraries all around the world. You know, there's often, often a tendency to think that what you do might be only, you might be the only library that does that, or India may be the only country that does it that way. But the interesting thing is that You've, it's really unlikely that you will be the only one. There'll be someone else that does it. Maybe not exactly the same, but close enough that you can make it work for both cases. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I wanted to end the, the keynote with this, what, a, a billion people in India? Let's get like 0.001% of them working on Koha, and that will be a massive, massive improvement. So thank you. <laughs>